So our subject tonight is, what is in your heart? Is it love for others? And the lens that we're going to use to view this topic is a verse from John 13. And it's Jesus speaking. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another just as I have loved you. And that's the standard that we expect to have to reach when we're talking about loving one another. We'll come back to that. Here's a little mind map of uh, our topics for the week. And we'll see here that if we have love for Jesus, or if we have the love of Jesus, as we were thinking last night, in our hearts, then almost automatically that will flow out in love to others. So that's how we're connecting the subjects today. There's many questions that a speaker should never ask of an audience, and one of them is, has anyone ever been to prison? So I'm not going to ask that one, because I might not like the answer. Um, But Jesus told the church in Smyrna that some of them were going to be thrown into prison. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. Now I've underlined the word some there, because it's clear that not all of the people in the church are going to go to prison, and maybe be martyred for their faith, just some of them. And I wonder, because this letter was probably read, um, maybe after the the breaking of the bread, when everyone was together, and it must have been a bit of a shock to hear this. And maybe their first reaction was, is he talking about me? Am I going to be one of those ones that is included in the sum? I hope not. I hope it's the guy sat next to me. Or maybe they thought, I hope it's me. I hope it's not my brother sitting next to me. I don't know how you would react in that situation, Um, but perhaps it's a test of the love that we have for others and whether we're prepared to put other people first, even in that most extreme example. This is an interesting story in Acts 21. Um, Paul is talking to the folks in Ephesus and just had this little scene acted out and there's a prophet called Agabus who comes up to Paul when the crowd's there and he takes the tun- the, uh, the belt off Paul's clothing and wraps it around Paul's hands and he's signifying that Paul is going to go to prison for his faith and he prophesies about what's going to happen to him shortly and the reaction is that the people start to burst into tears And Paul says, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You know what it's like, you know, when you're you're going away maybe for a long time or someone's leaving. And it's quite emotional. And they start crying. And he's saying, stop it, you're going to make me cry if you keep on crying. And Paul was like that, I think. We don't think of Paul as a very emotional person, perhaps. We think of him perhaps quite hard and quite uh, doctrinal and tough. And, and Paul says, seeing you so upset about what's going to happen to me is making me upset, so please, please stop it. You know, let's just smarten up here. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for what, what lies ahead. That word weeping is the same word that's used about Peter when he realized he denied the Lord three times and he said he went outside and wept bitterly. And the idea is of sobbing. It's not just this silent grief. It's, it's sobbing. It's, 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 it would be something that would be very difficult to hear, someone going through that amount of pain. And that was, that was the relationship that Paul had cultivated with these folks in the church there, that they, they were wailing, they were sobbing, because they didn't want to see him. And he says, Paul, my heart's breaking because I have to leave you, knowing that you're so upset about me going to jail and maybe dying. It's very unlikely, hopefully, that any of us are going to go to jail for our faith. I'm not going to make any judgment about any other reason. But living in Canada, it's very unlikely. We can't really out. We know there are Christians in, in, in the world, in places like China and Pakistan and Burma and India. This is a very real possibility that they will be imprisoned or abducted for their faith. But... It was something that happened quite regularly to the folks in the early churches that we read about in the New Testament. And Peter 
was in the firing line, one of the apostles, very high profile. And Peter one day was put in prison. And uh, there's a story that we, some of us know well. There was a prayer meeting held for Peter by the church. And we don't know the name of the, the, the people in the church. We do know that their servant was called Rhoda, because she appears in the story. And it says that while Peter was in prison, earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now this word earnest, a bit of an old-fashioned word. But the idea behind it is being fully stretched out. Just like that, that rope that's holding the boat on the shore is, is taut, it's fully extended. That's what it meant to be earnestly in prayer, to be fully stretched out. And we can imagine the people in the church fully laid out, maybe like this, stretched out in prayer before God. Because their concern for Peter was so real and so, so great. And this was in the middle of the night. Peter was, was asleep. And they probably all had jobs to go to in the morning. And yet they all came together. They didn't say, well, we've got a prayer meeting next Wednesday. We're just going to put that on the prayer board. They, they decided, we need to pray now. And they all got together and they had this prayer meeting. And of course, uh, there came a knock on the door and Rhoda went. And who was it but Peter? And the church, despite having a lot of faith to pray, don't believe it's him when he arrives. And uh, she has to persuade them. But that's, that's a, a wonderful example of earnest prayer, stretched out prayer. And Peter, interestingly, uses the same word in this verse. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So he's asking us to be stretched out, to be fully stretched out for each other, to, to, not, to not hold anything back, but to be fully stretched out. And we, our minds go to the cross at Calvary, where Jesus is fully stretched out for us. And that's, that's, that's love. And Peter's saying that's the, that's the extent of God's love for us, and that's the love that we be, should be showing for each other. We come to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, there's a, another reference to being in prison. And says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Now, like most of the scriptures that I'm quoting this week, it's from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Um, and it gives a, a certain I- idea of, of what the writer is talking about. And it, it refers to the body. And it reminds us that we are all part of the church, the body. And uh, Sydney, in, in one of the groups I was sitting in for a little bit, Reminded us that there's a verse that talks about if one part of the body suffers, then all the body suffers. You know that if you bang your ankle or stub your toe, your whole body feels it. And that's what God wants us to experience as a church. And the verse also says, if, if someone's rejoicing, then we all get to rejoice as well, um, which is good. But when we come to suffering, we're expected to share in each other's sufferings. The New Living Translation gives you a little bit of a different picture because it says in the second line, remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Now I'm not going to give you my opinion on which one of those is the more accurate. I think they both give us an interesting thought. But that's the extent to which we should empathise with people is that we should, as though we're feeling that pain in our bodies. That's, that's a high standard, isn't it? But that's what we're being asked to do. Paul did end up in prison. And in fact, he was there more than once. And in some cases, he was there for years. And just got stuck in the judicial system. And uh, he spent uh, the last chunk of his life basically in prison with a, with a couple of periods of house arrest. And it must have been tough. Paul was getting pretty old. And um, there was a guy that he, he shouted out in the letter to, to Timothy one of the good things about Paul being in prison was that he got some time to write some letters which we call today the prison epistles. And Tim, this first and second Timothy were two of those letters. And he writes to Timothy and he's asking God to bless this brother called Anesiphorus. And Paul says, he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Because of course, that was what prison was like in those days. You were shackled to guards so that you couldn't escape if you were a high profile prisoner like Paul and these were pretty dank dark dungeons not clean 
It would have been really smelly, dark, and it says, And Esiphorus often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, I wanted to explain what this word refreshed is. It's very nice. There you go. Can you feel that? See all that? I'm going to mess with some people's hair up here. Can we keep that right now? <laughs> this is in my cabin. I will be auctioning it tonight for the highest bidder. It's your belt. <laughs> It's, it's lovely. Come and see me afterwards. <laughs> this is this is what the word refresh means in, in the New Testament. You might recognize the dog, it's that's just a, a doppelganger. Um, the the word for refreshed means to cool with a breeze that's what that, that word refresh means and I don't know how Nessie Forrest did that um, he didn't have a fan like that I know, maybe he had some rolled up paper some parchments, something that he could take to Paul and when he went to visit him would just create this breeze that would cool Paul down and refresh him it must have been summer because if it was winter Paul would have been freezing because there was no central heating in those prisons and Paul in one of his letters says bring my cloak because I'm I'm freezing, that's what he was telling them Um, if if Anesiphorus had brought Paul a cloak in the summer that wouldn't have been much use but obviously he refreshed him and maybe he refreshed him in many other ways other than creating a bit of a breeze for him but nevertheless it's an example of an act of kindness to somebody in need and and Essie Forrest was willing to stand by Paul and do whatever it took to make sure he was supported through that trial. Again, in Hebrews, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, some of you, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partnered with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison. That word for partners is the same word that is used of John and James and Peter who were partners in the fishing business and they bought nets together and they split them up, the profits and the losses they were invested in each other and in their business and the writer here saying is you've all invested in each other and sometimes you were the ones that were suffering and other times it was others of you but you were all banding together to support each other and you had compassion on them and that's where we get our English word sympathy the Greek word is virtually the same as our word for sympathy today tough times as I said I don't think any of us are going to end up in prison for our faith but nevertheless that doesn't mean that there aren't tough times that come on us and there can be times of trial that that God sends there might be times of trial that happen because of our own actions Um, sometimes we may not know what the reason is but there will be tough times and the question is are we going to show love to each other in the tough times and also in the good times. Just wanted to say a little bit about you as a group of peers. And I know when you're young, peers are like people within three months of, of, of you. And anyone that's a year younger than you doesn't count. But the older you get, the, the peer group really widens. <laughs> so I think of people who are 60 in my peer group as well as people who are 40. That's just how it works. But wanted to encourage you to love each other and to look after each other I'm talking specifically to those of you who are in churches of God and you are brothers and sisters together serving in churches of God in various parts of the world of course we should love everybody Um, but we have a relationship we have signed up when when we were added to the church to continue steadfastly in fellowship in partnership it's the same word with each other and we have to have you have to have each other's backs because Jesus revealed to the church that it was the devil it was Satan that was putting them in prison of course it was actually the Roman authorities that were doing it egged on by the Jews as we were seeing this morning but it was actually the person behind it was Satan and Satan has lots of different tactics 
to split us up and to break us up, break us down. And as I said, it's probably in Canada, it's not going to be persecution by prison. But there will be other things that come. Temptations and trials and difficulties. And even people falling out. And people can be lost from the group and left behind. And it's your responsibility to love each other so deeply and so purely that, that, that Satan is not going to have that victory over those of us that are in churches of God. So I would encourage you to see each other as brothers and sisters. Those of you who have brothers and sisters know you didn't choose them. Sometimes you might not like them or get on with them, but I, I expect that you're always there for them, no matter what. When the chips are down, you're there for them. I would encourage you to take that mentality for the people, your, your peers, who you serve alongside in, in churches of God. But there's more than that, because the church of God, any assembly, is much more than people of one age group. And there are different demographics across different churches. And we have a responsibility to love everybody in the church, no matter what their age, what their background, their gender, whatever data point you want to use. We have a responsibility and a privilege of showing love to each other. Put together a list of some of the things that people in your church and my church might be going through. There are widows, there are lots of them in my church, who lost their husbands in, in most cases. I guess technically if, if it's a man that's lost a wife, he's a widower. But generally it seems to be these days we have widows. Not too dissimilar from New Testament days actually, that's a different topic. We have people who are single, who perhaps they were married once, or perhaps they've never been married, and they have their own challenges with that. There are people who are plain old, and the bodies aren't working as they used to. Some of them, because they're so old, are shut in, in a care home, unable to get to the church. There are many who are grieving. Loved ones have passed away. There are some who are physically isolated. They live a long way from the church. They just can't get there. There are people who are sick or other physical health issues. There are people with mental health challenges. This is a, a huge problem. That is a reality that we need to understand and appreciate and be sympathetic to and, and also learn how to, to deal with that and to help and to provide the correct professional help. <coughs> Marital problems. There will be marriages that, that are in difficulty. There will be people who are unemployed or not in the right career and that's a problem to them there are people who have old parents and they have to, to make decisions and care for them and they might live a long way away we have people who have children of whatever age who are concerned about them because they might have one of these issues we have people who are struggling spiritually some of them you might be able to guess others you would have no idea and there are some people who have issues with identity, about who they are. And again, that might not be something you'd be aware of, but it's an increasing issue in society today. That's a very long list. And if you wanted to spend the time to create a matrix of all the people in your church, or maybe the churches in Ontario, and, all, and list across the top all these things and put across where one applies, you'd be stunned to see how many how full your chart is. And it's our responsibility as members of the church to be aware of this and to respond and to show love to these people. Overseers, of course, have a responsibility to, to try and shepherd the flock and to pastor. But that's a responsibility for all of us. And it's something that is a... Is a Something we can all do in small ways and in bigger ways. 
I was saying in a group today, I was joking that, um, what's his name, where is he, the scouser, where is he, Johnny, there you go, um, Johnny and I can't, can't, we're not very good at making pies, we're very good at eating them, um, so we're not going to make pies for people, but other people are very good at making baking, as we saw this afternoon, and taking that, that pie to a person that's shut in, or is grieving and doesn't have the mental energy to do it themselves, such a small thing for you to do if that's your passion and your ability but to that person it means so much more than the pie it, it will make their week so Paul says to the Colossians put on then as God's chosen ones holy and beloved in other words loved by God compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience these are all the things that need to be in our hearts as we try to love each other we're going to come back to these in a minute. You'll see that the, the, the screen's gone a bit darker because I, we're going to go to some very dark places in, in the human heart in the next few minutes. And it just shows us that the human heart never changes. And God knows the human heart. And the Holy Spirit knows the human heart. And in this verse, all the sludge of the human heart is revealed. And we're going to go through what some of these attributes mean that stop us loving people and actually end up forcing us to do the opposite. And he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That, That word put away is the same word that's used when Paul pulled the anchor up from the boat and headed off to Malta. Just get out of here. Go as far away as you can from it. Bitterness, you know when someone's got a sour face, look like they've eaten some drunk a bottle of vinegar or something? That's the word for bitterness, and that's the idea behind it, even so far as poison, like somebody's drunk poison. And they're resentful maybe because things didn't go how they wanted them to. And they've got this bitterness that they just harbour in their hearts, and, and that's not good. The Bible says a lot about people who are bitter, and something called a bitter root that just takes root and it's very, very difficult to move. And we've got to guard against that kind of attitude. Wrath. I told you we're going to talk about temperature. This is about getting heated up and impulsively boiling over and losing your rag. That's what wrath is about. And some of us have short fuses. And uh, we kind of fly off the handle at people. And that's not good. Anger is something different. And it's worse because it's not spontaneous. It's actually a subtle thing. Even when you're quite calm, you've set yourself up at somebody. You're mad at somebody for something they did a while ago, and you've held that, and you're still angry. And so you you judge them by the opinion of them that you've already arrived at, and that's not good. So we've got to stop being angry at people. Clamour, I love this one. Somebody said that clamour is a wounded person emitting unearthly types of sounds. In other words, you know, like say that's he sounds like he's been shot. Um, That's what that word means. And if you look in your different versions of the Bible, there's lots of different translations. Brawling, harsh words, outcry, fault-finding, shouting, yelling, quarrelling, wrangling, insulting language. Are we ever guilty of that, any of that? Again, it goes back to this thought of being indignant, that you've been wronged, and you start to squawk and complain. And she said that to me. That's what, it, that's what it's about. And, and making a big din and makes, making a big fuss about things. Maybe we, we, we do that. Slander. That's the, the word we get for blasphemy. To speak um, disrespectfully of God is blasphemy. And to speak wrongly of others is blasphemy too. To be spiteful and to be abusive and to insult and to be rude. This is, these are the things that God says we're, we're often guilty of. Malice. It's a very old-fashioned word as well. Isn't there a, a Disney character called Mal- Maleficent? Maleficent. Maleficent. Yeah, I have to put my teeth in to say that. Well, I'm not sure what her character was like, but maybe it's something like this. Evil behaviour, wickedness, bad intentions, hateful feelings, hatred, ill will, a desire to injure. That's probably the worst of a lot. That's why it's left to the last of the list, because there's all kinds of malice. There's all ways that can crop up. These six things, we need to examine our hearts and, and think honestly if we're guilty of that. Now, 
it's one thing to occasionally slip up and be guilty of these things. But if we find that we're doing that regularly, and that's our habit, then we've got to, we've got to deal with that and let the Lord deal with that and purge it out and get rid of it. Paul says to the Ephesians, be kind, instead of all those, that horrible list, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's look at these. Kindness means to be usefully kind. So by bringing that pie to, to somebody that would actually like to eat the pie, um, not, not necessarily your, your, uh, your, your favourite recipe that they don't actually like, it's got to be useful. That wouldn't be kind. Being gracious. Tender-hearted. The word, is, the word used for tender-hearted is to do with your guts. So it's to do with that feeling in your gut when your heart goes out to somebody and you just, you just feel it in your stomach, that, that, that sympathy, and you want to do something to help them. Forgiving is favour that cancels through grace. So somebody's done you wrong, but you graciously allow that to pass and that you forgive them, even though they don't deserve it. And maybe they haven't even asked for it. You still forgive them. That's the kind of people we need to be. Humility. A deep sense of one's littleness produced by comparing ourselves to the Lord and not to others. It's the opposite of pride, of course, isn't it? Two that go together. We talked about, sang about meekness in one of our hymns, one of our songs. Meekness and patience. The power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness from a brother or sister in the church comes with good temper. So not losing it, but just taking it and, and not reacting back again. And that can be very, very difficult to do. And finally, compassion. A deep feeling about someone's difficulty or misfortune. These are the things, and there are many other things, that we should be known for, and our churches should be known for. And we need to think of ourselves and think of our churches. And which, which of those lists is more typical of us and our churches. Now hopefully, gradually and, and, and increasingly, it's that second list. In closing, Paul said to the church in Corinth, that's the ninth church that I wanted to cover, but don't really have time, but Paul and the church in Corinth didn't have a good relationship. He had a good relationship with Philippi, he had a good relationship with Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, I can never decide which one I want to say. He had a, didn't have a very good relationship with Corinth, and they fell out. And if you read the letter, the Second Corinthians letter, you'll see some Paul almost losing his rag and losing his his, his nerve because he's so upset about the, his, this relationship. But he still says to them, "You are in our hearts to die together and to live together." That was that was how far Paul was prepared to go for these people that he could cheerfully throttle. Uh, sometimes I'm sure. Um, he says I'm prepared to die with you if that's necessary if you go to prison I'm happy to go to prison with you and if I need to be nailed to a cross and covered in tar and set fire to I'll do that with you that's the standard that is expected of us in our churches and it seems so far away from our capability doesn't it just for me to be honest but that's what God expects of us because that's what Jesus did for us. He was prepared to die for us. And that we're back to this original thought. A new commandment I give to you. To love one another. Just as I have loved you. May God help us to do that. In our churches.